All right, well, you know, if you've uh, been alive, let's say the last two years, that we have been introduced to many new words and new concepts that have really swept into our public decision, discussion. Words like convergence, critical race theory, white guilt, white fragility, white privilege, implicit bias, systemic inequality, microaggression, disbanding the police, virtue signaling, identity politics, the 1619 project, intersectionality, just to name a few. And as you know, sides have been clearly taken. The battle lines have been drawn, and the debates between people on both sides have been very vicious. But when you analyze it, you come to the conclusion that many people that are so passionate about this cause, either on one side or the other, really have any clue as to what they're talking about. Very few have researched the accuracy of the narrative, and very few have contemplated the consequences of this new movement, whether you're an advocate for the new movement or you seek to deny this new movement, an opponent. But rather, our society has been swept away. And I would add, very emotionally, not by many voices in our country, which is what our country stands for, but rather a few dominant voices that have basically forced their opinion on everybody else. Now, I believe, and I'm speaking a little bit subjectively here, that there's very few people in our great country that would deny our scar of racism and slavery. I also believe that there's very few Americans that would actually support the action of racism or institutionalize slavery. But I also believe that there's very, very few Americans that are looking at this colossal situation, and might I add specifically, very, very few Christians that are looking at this colossal situation, like Booker T. Washington did, from and through the lens of Scripture. So you can see where I wish to go this morning for our combined outdoor service as we celebrate the Lord's Day on this Independence Day. I thought today, as we're all together for one unified service, we can talk about what brings true unity. Two simple points to today's message. First of all, we'll look at the problem of racism. And then second, we'll look at the solution to racism, both from the world's perspective and then also the Bible's perspective. So let's begin with the first point, the problem of racism. We really can't go much further without some kind of working definition. This is what racism is. It's a prejudice or a discrimination against a person or a people group simply on the basis of their racial or ethnic identity. You can see it is a problem. It is judging people that are less worthy than you based upon something they can't change, an immutable factor, specific in this case, like a differing skin color. Racism is real. Racism has existed in the world long before America's foundation. Racism was a problem in our country, and to some degree, I would admit, it still is today. It will always be existent as long as people live on the face of this earth who are basically sinners. The problem with racism from a biblical perspective is it is rooted, like any other sin, in the ultimate sin of pride. It's a superiority of self that I am better than somebody else based upon something I have that they don't have. And racism, like all pride, then manifests itself out in specific sins like anger, envy, hate, just to name a few. It's really a bizarre sin that you're going to hate someone simply by the color of skin that that individual has. Well, why is racism a sin in its a more fundamental and foundational state? It's because we need to start with God. 
When we talk about different skin tones, we must realize that people did not ask for those skin tones. They were born with those skin tones. And the person that gave us the skin color that we have is none other than God himself. God, yes, sees skin color. Of course, he sees everything. And in, to some degree, God can champion skin color just because it celebrates his creative diversity like he champions the different colors of leaves or the different smells of flowers. But we must understand that God does not ultimately, in the ultimate sense, care about skin color. First, or 1 Samuel 16, 7, God sees not as man sees. For it's man that looks at the outward appearance. But God looks at what? The heart. And that's how we should process as well. By considering the heart, not the externals that are unchangeable, mutable. As a matter of fact, when you read about God throughout all of Scripture, He doesn't even break society down into multiple races. There is one human race that is divided amongst what the Bible calls the world or specifically the nations. For example, who was Israel to love? Leviticus 19. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. You love Israel, all people, like you love yourself. To whom does God love? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, the nations, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, in Christ, shall not perish in hell. To whom was the Messiah sent? I'll go to the Old Testament, Isaiah 42. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. When the apostles at Pentecost were called to preach the gospel, to whom did they go? Acts 15, at the Jerusalem Council. Peter says, And God, who knows the heart, testified to the nations, to the Gentiles, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did us. And he, God, made no distinction. Did you hear that? No distinction between them, Gentiles, and us Jews, cleansing all of our hearts on the basis of our faith. To whom did the Holy Spirit come? Acts 2.17. And it shall be, quoting Joel 2, in the last days, God says, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. To whom do we reach with the gospel? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, Matthew 28. And who are the recipients of heaven? Revelation 7, 9. And behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribe and people and tongue were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. There is Revelation or Romans 2 to 11, no partiality with God. God, listen, loves all people, the one human race. And if we are children of the living God, we should love all people, not certain people or different people to different degrees based upon some immutable characteristic. You, however, you're fulfilling the raw law of liberty. You're doing well. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, James 2, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. Favoritism, partiality, regardless of skin color or any other human social construct that we place upon other people must never, never be tolerated in the Christian church. We are not to look at each other and judge each other based upon the way that God has created us. Because James 4.12, there's only one lawgiver and one judge who's able to save and destroy but who are you to judge your neighbor? Only God, Romans 2, 6, will render to each person according to his individual deeds. Not groups of people that are being judged, but rather individuals 
based upon personal accountability before the living God. Amen. Therefore, according to God, true greatness, and this is also according to Martin Luther King, by the way, is not measured in skin color as we hear today. But rather, true greatness is measured in the content of a person's character. And that is not a nebulous term to define what kind of character you think should be promoted in society. It is character based upon the conformity to God's attributes as they are manifested in the heart of a believer through the Holy Spirit by His grace. Jesus said in John 7, 24, Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with a righteous judgment. Righteous judgment is to be able to look at people based upon character, not skin tone, not athletic talent, not popularity, not education, not wealth, but rather character, not motives, but character. That's what makes a great person. A person, a man or woman, who is a faithful and godly spouse, godly grandparent, godly child, godly parent. It's promoting traits like honesty, integrity, and dignity. It's standing for biblical truth, defending life, caring for the innocent, helping the needy, practicing sexual morality. It's demonstrating love and gentleness and self-control and kindness. And that list clearly continues. That's what makes for true greatness in the eyes of God. To reduce life, specifically in this case, to skin color, not only diminishes, listen, the primacy of character, but it also negates God's universal love for all humankind who are created, as I read, equally in his image, unlike the rest of created order, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Therefore, to conclude the first point, racism is superficial. It's hateful. It's bigoted. It's prideful. It's self-defeating. It's anti-gospel. And it is godless. So what's the solution? Second point. Let me take it first from a perspective from the world as to how they would say we need to deal with the situations that are at hand. We can't go any further without talking about the hot topic, and that is critical race theory. I'm sure you've heard that term before. Most people have heard that term, and even people that are arguing for it or against it, I don't think they even know what it means. I'll call it CRT from now on in this message. CRT was formulated back in the 70s and 80s because of a lack of progress people felt that was being made in regard to the racial justice, social justice movement. Its roots actually go back to the 20s and 30s to uh, Frankfurt, Germany, at the University of Frankfurt Institute in Germany. It stems from the 1619 Project, which seeks to put slavery at the foundation of our country. That's where we start as a country, and our country must be interpreted under the lens of slavery, not under the lens of the Constitution, or as we are celebrating today, the Declaration of Independence. CRT holds, and I quote their words, not my own here, it holds that there is no absolute truth. Advocates for CRT hate what I am doing today and what you are listening to today. There is no place for a rational dialogue regarding CRT. And if we're going to talk about it, we do not bring God into the equation. The Word of God is not an absolute truth. Scripture doesn't count for anything. And they should not be added into the discussion at all. And they are smart. Because we say that God has created all people equal, and there is a God, and he's the one that made people that way. Well, obviously, the system doesn't hold up any longer. All people are divided as either oppressors or victims. And that could change throughout time in history. The nuclear family, of course, must be dismantled. The most important thing about a person is not their character. It's not their convictions. 
it's not even their humanness, but rather it's their quote-unquote race. And despite all the time, money, and blood that has been spent in our country to distance ourselves from our racial past, America at its core is systemically racist, they say. And therefore, the values that we hold to so dearly as this country all must be dismantled. Don't think for a moment, and they will say it themselves, that this is a continuation of the civil rights movement. It's a repudiation of it. Martin Luther King, they will say, was wrong. Or at best, he was just simply naive. Barack Obama is not a huge fan of them. From a secular perspective, the opponents are fighting, as you know, against CRT. And if you're watching the news, many states right now, obviously it's a big deal because many states in our great nation have banned CRT in their public schools and even pushing toward their universities. People that don't want it, that have a problem with it, would say this. It does not produce self-sufficient individuals. That's not, you know, we use that in a bad way in the church self-sufficiency, but in this sense, it's a good way. What we seek to produce here in America are people that are able to go out, get an education, hold a job down, support their family, and not depend upon government. That's a self-sufficient, that's a good thing to produce in a country. It does not produce a country that belongs to all Americans equally. It does not produce intrinsic equality of all people or liberty for all people. It does not respect other convictions. It does not trust in a civil engagement, there's no place for that. And it does not celebrate our nation's progress in this area and the rich history that we have. To them, CRT is an ideology, not history. From a spiritual perspective now, Christians might agree with a lot of what I just said. But we must see things, folks, not from a secular perspective, but through the lens of scripture. And I believe Vody Bakum, our friend Vody Bakum, who's been to this church twice now, a black man himself, if you don't know him, has been one of the leading advocates for people thinking biblically about this specific subject. And if you want to read a good book, I've not read it yet, but I've, I've read parts of it in quotes, pick up his new book called Fault Lines. To him, CRT is basically an idol. It's a false god that is presenting itself as a new religion. So if I can put what I said, what they said, and what is happening in our society today into spiritual terms, it would kind of go something like this. From zealous evangelists, converts are brought to its side by fear and intimidation. Rational debate, examination of the beliefs, Verification of the narrative, well, none of those are tolerated because this is a religion that demands blind faith. The heretics of this new religion are those who do not agree and do not submit wholeheartedly with its dogma. The yoke is heavy. The burden is simply impossible to bear. And you might surrender today as you see people doing all the time on the news, but more will be demanded of you tomorrow. Because your profession will never be remorseful enough, just ask Drew Brees. Your financial offerings will never be large enough, just ask any American corporation. There is nothing you can do to appease the wrath of this almighty God. Most frightening, most frightening is that your greatest sin, your greatest sin is your unchangeable skin color. So therefore there's no opportunity for you to change. There's no repentance. And without repentance, there's no forgiveness. And without repentance and forgiveness, there's absolutely no grace. You are told that you must live the rest of your life in perpetual guilt. And there is no lasting atonement for your sin. Because the God of COT, CRT has condemned you for a race that you didn't ask for, a motive that you might have never imagined, and a sin that you might have never committed. But those are the original sins that you must bear. There is no hope. There's absolutely no hope for you, but you must still bow to its demands or face the eternal wrath of being labeled by the whole world a racist. 
as Vody Bakum said, at the preaching of diversity, equity, and inclusion, officers, corporate CEOs, university presidents are trembling and crying, saying, what must we do to be saved? So what is the biblical solution? Well, we start where we always start with the revelation God has given to us in the scripture. So number one, as a Christian, we must, we must always go to the narrative of the word and not the narrative of the world. The narrative of the world is always changing. It's manufactured almost every time by the world itself. The very people, 1 Corinthians 2, that put Jesus on the cross. The very world that is seeking, Romans 12, 2, to conform you every second of the day into its image. They are playing music, and all of a sudden, Christians now feel they need to dance to that tune. Our church will not, nor has it ever, bowed to the current demands of society. We will get our cues from Jesus Christ himself. We have been preaching against racism, I know, ever since I have been here. Every sermon I've ever preached is online. You can see what I said about every subject. I have never been called a racist, nor has any single person of our church, nor has our church, from what I understand and from what I've heard. That's the way it's always been. That's the way good Christians always have been. Going back to the time of slavery, the good Christians were the ones that were saying, this has to stop. We welcome all people at Grace Bible Church. All people. Our doors are open to everybody, regardless of their gender or their age or their education or their wealth or their skin color, because we share all as one the same position in Christ. And therefore, all people, that is every one of you that hears my voice right now, deserves the same respect, the same love, the same listening ear, the same helping hand as everybody else in this church. No one is better and no one is worse. And number two, we love this position because it is not our invention. We take no credit for it. It's the one that has been created by Jesus Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. He is the head. We are the body. And therefore, we listen to him, follow his marching orders, and allow him, as he says in Matthew 18, to build his church. 16. A church where all people are equally loved. A church where all people are acknowledged as being equally justified by the blood of Christ. A church that is fully immersed, as 1 Corinthians 12 says, in Jesus Christ himself. As differing body parts, all part of one family and community. And as a result of this equal status, number three, any division between human differences, whatever that might be, has been abolished in Christ. It's not that we need to start doing that. It's been done, and therefore we accept it as a fact. And to place upon the church some invention by the world that is, at times, anti-biblical, a social construct must not be permitted, must never be accepted. Ephesians 2. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, so that in himself he might make the two groups into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, in it by putting to death the enmity. Therefore, number four, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free man, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. We do not fight racism with more racism by elevating certain people above other people. We do not fight racism with anti-racism 
Racism is destroyed when people come to Christ. Therefore, we must preach the gospel. That is the solution to racism. Romans 10, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek. I mean, how many times does Paul have to say, I'm reading different verses here. The same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And when we come to Christ, we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us and begin true heart transformation, conforming our characters to the image of Christ and making us true, great men and women. And in doing so, we put off the hate, we put off the pride, and we replace it with love and acceptance for all people, an acceptance of God's beautiful, diverse, creative design. We celebrate that. And I've said that since the day I arrived. I still pray that our church becomes more multi-ethnic because you will never see any society in our country or the world where the diversity of people can get together and love each other in a way that only one homogenous group can do. That celebrates gospel. For it was God who created all people equally. And therefore every person, every person, even the worst sinners out there, have intrinsic worth. Not because of skin color, but the fact that they were created unlike the rest of created order in the very image of God. Therefore to use race as a driving force will only cut people off from ever coming to Christ because people are declared righteous because of a skin color and that people must bow down to them as if they are a God. And if you think you are a God and you think you are self-righteous, well, you have no need for a savior. And for the other half of society, well, they're already guilty. They've been declared guilty, not by God, but by humanity. And they are called to repent. And instead of repenting of their sins and turning to the true God, they are repenting to a false savior of something they can never repent from. So today we celebrate Independence Day. We are not a perfect nation. And as our forefathers envisioned that we would strive to become better and better as we go, but that doesn't mean we just can everything our country has ever stood for. It doesn't mean we burn the American flag or turn our back to it. We look at our weaknesses. We seek to improve those weaknesses. But we also celebrate the greatness of how God has blessed us. To walk out today and not thank God for this beautiful day would be a problem. To look at how God has ministered to your family and not thank God for that would be a problem. And the same is true for the country in which we live. As I speak right now, we are freely gathered. We have religious freedom to gather together without fear. How many countries can do that? We have the freedom of expression. We have judicial court systems. We still have the right to bear arms if we wish. We have a strong military that protects us. We got strong law enforcement that keeps us safe. We go home and we drink clean water, we breathe clean air, and we have an abundance of food. There's no one invading our coast nor are bombs dropped on our city. If America is such a horrible nation, who's better? Who's been more blessed? And because of that, we need to acknowledge if every good and perfect gift comes down from above, God has blessed us here in this country. And we should thank him for that. We love all nations as Christians. Any Christian that makes it just about our country is not thinking in a missional perspective. But we've had it good in this country that we call our home. And as many of you know, you've had loved ones in this lifetime or generations past that have shed blood to give us the blessings of freedom that we enjoy. Boy, let's be grateful. A whole lot of people want to come here. 
Not a whole lot of people are leaving. We're grateful for Independence Day. But we're ultimately grateful for the Independence Day that we can celebrate every day. The ultimate blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The God in his mercy and grace who rather than send us and condemn us to hell would choose to go to a cross and die a vicious death and to become sin for us to take our sin upon himself and to face the wrath and the justice that we deserved that we might be forgiven and that we might enter a relationship with God and be adopted into this body of God and be brought together into this family that God calls his church and his people simply through our faith as we receive the free grace that God has given us. That's what God does for us. For our Lord's yoke, as he said, is easy to bear and his burden is light. Only the true God, folks. It's not the talking pundits. It's not the dominant voices. It's not the trending voice today that will be different a year or two from now. It is only God that offers us true peace and lasting hope. Freedom from our sin, freedom from our victimization, freedom from our guilt, freedom from our resentment, freedom from the world's mold that wants to squeeze us in every day, and freedom from superficial thinking. He provides forgiveness to us, to our lives, to those who sin against us. As Vody Bakum said, forgiveness is the only solution to racism. Only Christ's forgiveness by his death on the cross can deal with our sins, including the sin of racism. This is what our culture must hear, a convincing presentation of the gospel. And in God's time, we pray a spiritual revival. Father, we thank you for the greatness of the salvation we have in Christ. Help us to think biblically. Help us to receive for ourselves the riches that have been purchased for us by Jesus. And help us as your people to share with a world that is very lost the true meaning of forgiveness and love. Bless us, Lord, as a church, as a nation, and as a world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, brothers and sisters, it is good to be together today. As you know, we are uh, having a picnic. The brass band will be uh, around here somewhere playing some music for us. Um, I was told if you're up top, there's food up top for you. Uh, and if you're down lower, you can either kind of go up top or there's also food in the back there. Uh, we want to get you a free lunch today, some beverages, and you're welcome to stick around and talk to each other and enjoy this beautiful weather God has given you. God bless you. God bless you. And may God bless Grace Bible Church. Have a great afternoon.